Hello and welcome to Santo Sam and Ed's Total Football Summer Series podcast on your ABC. Today, Sam and I are privileged to be joined by a very special guest. Are we not, Sam? Are you feeling excited? Mate, I'm actually a bit nervous. I am. <laughs> have a listen to I'm this. I'm nervous you're not going to finish this <laughs> have, intro. <laughs> have a listen to these accolades. NSL Coach of the Year, twice. A-League Coach of the Year, just the once though. AFC Coach of the Year, PFA Manager of the Decade. He's played for Australia at junior and senior level. He's captain of the South Melbourne Hellas Team of the Century. A big one. He's won premierships and championships in both NSL and A-League, not to mention this country's very first international silverware, the Asian Cup. And more recently, he's even won a couple of wet T-shirt competitions. Please welcome <laughs> great friend of the show, the boss, and Poster Coglu. How are you, Ange? Oh, I'm, I'm great, mate. I'm, uh, I'm good. Yeah. Hey, mate, look, t- interesting. I was thinking about you this morning as I was driving into the studio. It's a stinking hot day today in Melbourne. And I was thinking, I wonder whether Ange is a... Windows down or air conditioning man? In the no, no, air condi- Mate, you saw me in the UAE. I'm no good. <laughs> I'm no good in the heat, mate. So it's windows up. When did you make the decision to go from, from windows to... Because, you know what I mean? You, uh, for a while, you go, no, I'm going to stick with the windows Well, down. I think my first car, the Datsun 200B, mm-hmm. I literally had one window winder for both. And I remember trimmers. I used to pick for up both. trimmers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had no air conditioning. And to actually do it, we had to, I had to wind out mine, <laughs> pass over the window winder to trimmers, and then he'd do his... <laughs> That's good. I had a. I had. I had. That is unbelievable. I used to have a Datsun Stanza, which was it was brown. We used to call it the metallic turd, and it, it was it only had second and fourth gear because I figured, well, why fix it up? You don't need really need first. You what can get it? going in second. Yeah, absolutely. Rolling start. Then, oh, can you? Rolling, <laughs> rolling start yeah, every time. Sort of. You can. You can. You sort can of. just manoeuvre it. Where'd you get your Datsun? Do you remember? I, I think it was my first car. So the uh, I think the old man just picked it up at a used. Oh, car. Dad, I actually Dad bought your car, did he? He did. He was <laughs> no, very nice. Really yeah, 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 exactly. He bought my current car. No, he hasn't. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I, I didn't get my license till late. To be fair, I don't know why, but I was, oh, I was about twenty. I wasn't one of those guys who rushed for it. No. Your license or your taxi license? No, you? no, no. The taxi <laughs> license came when I was sixteen. <laughs> this is a this is a good indication, Andrew, about what you're in for. Yeah, uh, we started with we started stuff. with the hard stuff yeah. first. Well, just forget wish... about forget about the offsiders, mate. <laughs> let's, let's get things going with the uh, starting with the the big news that uh, Mario Milano passed away really at 81 this week a, a seminal figure growing up for you uh, as a lover of wrestling or not really M- mate uh, world championship wrestling on a on a Sunday mate it was a ritual at our house Sunday was my f- favorite day of the mm-hmm. week because that was obviously football day in the afternoon but it was breakfast in bed with the old man and it was the only time the old man sort of sort of kicked back a bit and part of the ritual was as soon as World Championship Wrestling came on, we'd have a wrestle in the in the bed, Spiros yeah, yeah, yeah. Rion versus Mario <laughs> Milano, and That's, off we go. It, 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 you're absolutely, Sam, you have no idea growing up, at the, I'm a bit older than Ange, but that was, the ritual was breakfast, and then you'd, you'd wait for the wrestling to start. There used to be, Bob Santa Maria used to, there used to be a sort of like a point of view kind of political, there was, half yeah, religious thing, and, all, and he was an Italian guy, so most of the Italians sort of put up with him a little bit, but by the end they're going, get off your ball, <laughs> bastard, because they just want the wrestling to start. And yeah. then after the wrestling, you'd start, maybe watch the first 20 minutes of Epic Theatre, there yes, was a Swords yeah, and Sandals absolutely. movie, yeah, yeah. and then it was time to go to the yeah, yeah. But you, you couldn't watch the whole film because yeah, yeah, it was time to go to Mario start. Milano, he was, yeah, he, and he was almost like a, you know, um, a, a Greek in our household because um, yeah, we love Spiros Arena. Spiros Arena, they partnered up. They partnered up. The Golden Greek, the Golden Greek, yeah. Uh, and they partnered up, and uh, yeah, he was big, mate. What was my, what was Mario's move? Oh, he had he had the. I think he may have done a bit of a sleep abdominal stretch. Maybe there was oh, an yeah. abdominal stretch involved. I think he did the sleeper hold for a little while. The good thing about the sleep, the funny thing about the sleeper hold was whoever did the sleeper hold. There was all, there was only one person in the whole auditorium that could get you out of it. They're going, they're going. Oh, how do we wake the guy up? Hang on, we've got to get blah blah blah. Who's in the audience? He's a former referee, and he'd come out and he'd do that that sort of a reverse yeah, kind of thing, and, and, and they'd wake and up. They'd wake yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was like, what I was. I was probably about seven or eight years old. I used to put the sleep hold my old man, and I thought he would work, mate, because he would. He would. It was the only way I could get him because he was obviously a big bloke. He'd throw me around. Yeah, but that was my move. Yeah, I used to do the old rocking chair. Tex McKenzie used to just. It was it was the most comfortable of all the holes. At all. You'd, you'd, most you'd, comfortable. That's because, what you're looking for. That's exactly. You'd, <laughs> you'd get some guy. You'd, you'd sit with the legs outside another person yeah. sitting in front of you, and you'd lift them up with your legs intertwined, and then slam them down onto their bottoms. So, like it was. There was no. So I missed this era, but I came in the one just after with yep. the WWF. So mm. WrestleMania was the first time I'd seen it. Right, and the Iron Sheik had the camel clutch, yep. and then mm. uh, I think someone had the. 
Talk about putting on moves. I put a move on my brother, you know, the figure four leg lock. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. I put the figure four leg lock on my brother, and what, as basically you end up just s- sitting across from each other. <laughs> exactly. And, and he, he said, what are you doing? I mean, <laughs> neither of us knew who was supposed to be hurt. <laughs> we, uh, the camel clutch, though, the that camel could clutch, genuinely hurt. That could hurt. The uh, What we used to do, people sometimes ask me, you know, did, were you theatrical as a kid? Did you used to put on shows and stuff like that? And... Uh, my cousins and I, we uh, we lived in Collingwood, but we used to go to Preston to my to my cousin's place, and they used to have sliding doors, two sliding doors that opened up, and we used to think that they were like curtains of a stage. So we used to get get the oldies to say, "You can be on the lounge room side. We were on the dining room side. Open the doors, and we'll put on a show for you." And it was wrestling. <laughs> So we wouldn't put on a play. We'd put on wrestling for them. <laughs> Which is... Because it's a form. Pretty it's much a play it's anyway. A, it's a form of <laughs> theatrics in a way. Mate, I don't even want to straighten up. But, you know, I mean, people will get upset if we don't, you know. If we don't. But and you came out... Uh, you were born in Greece? I was, yes. You yeah. came out here and I think, uh, look, I've read, uh, look, I've read your books and I, and I love it. And I keep going back to your first couple of chapters, which is you growing up here in the inner, inner suburb of, of Paran. Um, you tell some amazing stories. I, I, you know, I won't go into them, just... Uh, some of them are heart wrenching, and some of them are just yeah. just really informative. Uh, those memories as a kid are they subconscious memories, or do you remember them very clearly at the front of you? Most front of them of... are pretty vivid. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I like I don't remember life in Greece at all. So kind of every vivid memory I have um, has was here in Australia. Most of it was pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I um, those kind of things have stayed along with me and. Um, so when I was kind of recounting the stories for, for the book, I, I could almost be really or very descriptive about them because I, I, I remember living them. It wasn't just somebody that sort of passed on the story to me. A couple of my dad passed on, mm-hmm. so I kind of, um, you know, went with the imagination there. But uh, the ones that I lived, yeah, no, they're very clear. What was it like living in uh, in in a, in a Melbourne? It was at that mate, time? I, I, I was I was happy. You know, mm-hmm. it was like it was it was a great existence. Yet if I think about it now and my parents are always struggling and yet they sh- they obviously shielded that from their kids but mate, uh, like this time of the year you know when when it's when it's, you look outside and it's like eight o'clock and still day I just remember being outside it's the best, I was having that kick or playing cricket summer was cricket for me so I'd be there with the neighborhood kids till literally nine o'clock playing in the park or on the street on the street mm. no on the street we had a garage we had mm. the rubbish bin um just uh, as the garage started was the good line and length because if you hit the crack there, you'd get it in there. Um, <laughs> you were a fiery, fast bowler, Andrew. What were you? Not fiery. I was more clever than fire. <laughs> fiery. <laughs> Methodical. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, and I loved the bat, but it was just it was just being outside. I mean, I never remember being inside yeah, yeah. at all. And and even though my sister was older than me, so I didn't have a brother to sort of share with. The neighbourhood was my kind of you know sort of extended family and, and we just pick up games there. Isn't it funny? We spoke to John Aloisi um, the other week and he said his father uh, was a, a decent cricketer in Adelaide mm-hmm. and he spoke about how um, the idea that, you know, you come from overseas and you, you, you do it because you want to sort of be accepted into, into the society you're in. But I seem to remember playing cricket just around the corner from your place, Sam, when you grew up in, in Collingwood on the street. We didn't do it out of wanting to join into, you know, to... Australian society. We did it because no, it was the thing that was that you fun, did. It's a fun game to, fun it's a fun game to, play. to play on the street. It did is. You play in, 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 were you in, where were we in Keel Street? Yeah, well, what, not, we're not giving away. We're we giving away <laughs> property. Did you play cricket on the street in Keel Street? Absolutely. Or, or was, or was yeah. the, that, your generation already playing it we on a, a We did a, a bit PS1. of both. We went out the backyard as well. Yeah. Uh-huh. But but I know what Angie's talking about. When you put that bin up against the garage, yeah. it is a... Uh, you know, yeah, it's it's a it's, it, it's a it's a big moment in a young man's career. It, it's funny you talk about the because my father just couldn't accept cricket, right? He just did not understand it. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't accept it with any like footy. He could sort of you know he could get into half get into, but I was obsessed with it. So I finally convinced him once. Look, you got to take me, and he took me to a test match. Oh, and no. this is six hours for my old man, right? This is this is his hard working week, right? Yeah. So we've gone and it's England versus Australia. And for, for some reason that day, Chris Tavares was batting. Do you remember Chris Tavares? Yeah, 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 Chris Tavares. Sorry. That wouldn't have helped your father. Mate, helped your father. It was the slowest day you could ever. And my old man's twitching <laughs> and he's and he's thinking. And you know, back then you could have a, a, a cigarette at, at the. And he, that's all he did, right? And yeah. he still smokes today. So anyway, we're there, and, and it was about. I swear, it must have been an hour. After it was yeah between uh, an hour um, after lunch, so it was between the lunch and, and tea break, and he had three hours plus the lunch break. He's doing his head in, goes to light his cigarette, drops his lighter, f- goes down to pick it up, and 
a wicket falls. The only <laughs> wicket of the day. And I've gone, yes, Lily. And he looked up to me and he goes, what happened? I go, quick, uh, wicket. And there was no replays. There. He goes, that's it. We're going home. That's it. We left halfway. Never again. He goes, I spent three hours there. I he went to pick up my lighter, and I missed the only action of the day. Oh, that's right, stiff, mate. They yeah. get Chris Davera oh, on, no, on, exactly. on a long yeah. day. Seven hours turns into 17 hours. <laughs> yeah. did, you, whatever, did you show him, like, Viv Richards, or did you show him yeah, Dennis like, Lilly? I tried, Amad, but he just, he just couldn't fathom that, you know, six hours of sitting there just didn't. How did he go with AFL? He wasn't bad. He wasn't mm. bad. But again, like, he, I, I just think there was a real resistance there that he just, you know, he wanted nothing to get in the way of of football and me mm. and him and that was it. So any other sport. Whereas my mum loved it. She got mm. right into it. Like she became a Carlton supporter and every, any sport she'd watch, like even now she'll watch the AFL on, mm -hmm. on TV, whatever game's on. Just because of a, a child's natural inclination to rebel though, just because dad wanted you to play mm. the world game, did what about your, what were your feelings on, on Aussie rules? Did you play? Uh, yeah, I did. And, and I kind of mentioned in the book that, you know, I, I got, you know, it was kind of a seminal moment because I got an award when I was in primary school for the most improved. You know, they give the most improved to it. So I must have started off with low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and I did all right. I think actually the year before couldn't mark the ball, but that's fine. Yeah. 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 But then so, most improved, you're on the way up. But, but, but I'm going all right, so I've come home. Your I've, dad missed the moment. He was having a cigarette at the time. <laughs> dropped his lighter. He dropped what his happened? lighter. As Andrew's <laughs> getting the trophy presented to him, he dropped oh, his mate, lighter. It, it's even worse than that. I've come home and I've put... And I put the trophy on the dinner table because that's when I, you know, Dad used to come home and he literally wouldn't say hello to anyone. We'd sit at the dinner table because he was always late and we'd we'd start dinner. That was the ritual. But I had this trophy in the middle of the table and Dad sat down. And he was, you know, he was, you know, hadn't had a shower or anything. He was just wrecked from work and he kind of looked at it. And at first I thought he sparked up a bit, but then he saw the shape of the ball on the trophy, <laughs> right? And he goes, "What's that?" I said, "Oh, one, you know, most proof." He goes, "Okay." He just went out of his seat he goes get out in the backyard we're gonna have a kick oh. with a ball just, just. He, he shattered me in in one instant but on the other instance it was quite inspirational that that's wow. how dogged he was about and to be fair sam old man is a typical there wasn't a lot of rebellion in me towards my man i was pretty scared of him mate yeah. i was uh and I, I i grew with it anyway i mean i there was part of me as i say in the book that I wanted to be close to him. And the only way I could be close to him was this sport. There was nothing else. There was no other connection between me and my father but this sport. So as a young boy, mate, he was such a, a driver for me initially. And then it just sort of you know, grew from there. That's interesting uh, that you say you brought the trophy home and that's how re he reacted. Because uh, it, more recently than that, did you not come home with a, an Asian yeah, cup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. if Sam's heard this story. Yeah, no. I mean, he, he's, look, uh, and people always ask me, how do you, you know, how do you go with the with the critics and the scrutiny around you and all that sort of stuff? And I go, man, it doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. I just, you know, it's part of the job. It's part of me likes that. It. it kind of challenges me and all that. I said, but if there's one person's criticism I can't take, it's my old man's, right? And he's he's never, I've never been good enough. So we won the Asian Cup and I've come home and I've kind of showed him the medal and I said, Dad, you know, here's the Asian Cup medal. And he goes, yeah. He goes, well done, son. But if you'd made a substitution, you wouldn't have to go to extra time. <laughs> That is Mate. incredible. That's, I, and another, that's fantastic. I, I've, even, fantastic I've got an even better one because I didn't put it in the books. I'm saying for the autobiography. I'll tell you guys. Anyway, <laughs> not many will hear, will they? No, 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 <laughs> no. Trust me. No, no one knows. The, 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 <laughs> the people who like the TV show, Andrew, which you appeared on a couple of times, they, they, I think they like us and they like the show and they like what we do, but they don't know what a podcast is. Mate. <laughs> they're not making that. They're mate, not coming with us. Mate, I was in Campbelltown on the weekend, and the amount of the people that come, like, mate, mate, that World Cup show that you did. I'm going. What era was that? That was in 2010. That's six years on, ago. Six years ago on SBS. Anyway, yeah. keep going. So anyway, I, I, after the World Cup in, in in Brazil, which was kind of my first major tournament, mm -hmm. yes, we didn't win any games, but you know, we I thought we did all right and. We made uh, we got this book made of um, just a, a photography throughout the, that World Cup. The experience it was a really nice bound book. Cost me a few grand. Beautiful. I thought I'd get him for Christmas, mm. and uh, so I've gone over and I've given him this book, and he's kind of looking through it, and he goes, "What's this?" I said, "Oh, it's uh, it's it's you know it's the history or not the history, but the uh, sort of a color uh, photograph." Photograph, uh, all the photographs from the World Cup and our experience there. My experience is a personal thing, and he's kind of he goes, "Oh yeah, he goes that's the team that didn't win any games, isn't it?" I go, "Yeah, that's that's the one, Dad." Just <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that he gave a title to the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what he it's a hard man. Photographic journey of the team that didn't win any games. Yeah, mate. Yeah, so seriously, sorry. I know that you love him, and it, this sounds like a very 
that sounds like a tough relationship, mate. It is. You it ever is. Gonna, so it is. If you win a you win an Asian Cup and you know how are you going to win him over? I, I don't think I ever am, and, I, and this I podcast might do it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I very much doubt it, mate. I, I've had this discussion with Santo, and um, <laughs> yes. it's and I don't think it's a unique experience. Anyone no. kind of growing up in that era with the, with sort of European fathers or maybe just fathers in general, they were just. It was just a, they were just harder people back then. You know? and, it's and a I th- complex. They're complex creatures. And, and I think they, he thought that's the only way he'll continue to motivate me. He figures, you know what, if if he's never sort of going to please me, it'll keep him going. It's worked well. So, and look, it's it is it's it's a it's it's a bizarre relationship, but um, yeah, I love him to death, and I'm sure in his own way, I'm, he's proud of me and all that sort of stuff. But and can I ask, uh, because often the, the relationships, certainly with uh, with people of that generation that, that come out here as migrants, changes from fathers to grandfathers. Now, mm. your, your your older boy is mm. uh, he's he's at the age where he's playing at a, at a very good level. Mm. What's the relationship with his grandfather? Loves him to death, mate. He cuddles him. He tells him he loves him every day. And he never oh, did that with me. <laughs> <every day. laughs> never did that with me. They can't do anything wrong, mate. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, it is. It's And it, and it's funny because then I, I kind of look at because I've got three boys. So I'm kind of going, what kind of dad am I going to be? Mm. And I've kind of, at the initial bit, especially with my eldest, I've gone the other way. I'm kind of really positive with him. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of going, maybe I should have be a little bit harder maybe Jeez. he's turning out a bit soft you know um, but it's it, it is it must be very hard because that that was just the relationship with your father now i know that as a kid you were extremely determined in the book you tell an amazing story about you know you be, ended up being the captain coach of your of your high school side when you you were in year seven year seven yeah, year yeah, seven yeah, yeah. It was a 12, and yeah. and um Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that particular. There was a, a seminal t- tournament that that maybe was one of the things that maybe yeah. shaped you you in yeah, for the future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so Paran back then, Paran High, and Paran High School in particular was, um, yeah, Paran Footy Club was just down the road. The the uh, the uh, the old uh, VFA club, the mm. Two Blues. So yeah, Sam played there. Did yeah, that's I right. Did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the two blues. Orang, so, or, uh, Turak Park on Orang correct, Road. Orang Road. So Paran High School was at the other end of Orang Road, and um, and. It was a very strong uh, sort of uh, Aussie rules culture. So we kind of, we were sort of the first sort of intake of European migrants, particularly there's a lot of Greeks around there. Um, so we said when we got to high school, year seven, that, you know what, we're going to make, we're going to take over the soccer team here. And they said, yeah, yeah, go for it. You know, there's one soccer team, the junior team. And they gave us um, last year's hand-me-downs of the Aussie rules jumpers. So we had woolen sleeveless <laughs> with the big collars <laughs> and the big golden V in front of us. And tight footy shorts, right? With that's hoops. not something you'd see at the uh, with at, at the socks. That's you're not going to see that at the Real Madrid. No, no, absolutely no, no. So that was our. So that was last year's Aussie rules, and they said, "And your coach is Mister. I forget his name now, but he was our music teacher." <laughs> And, <laughs> and, Isn't that perfect? Yeah, yeah. You're the music oh, teacher. Now you're the football. Yeah, coach. that's it. Yeah. And uh, and literally his coaching sessions were uh, here, boys. Here are the balls, some balls from last year, and some cones. And he'd sit next to a tree uh, and get out the homework for the day and start marking the kids' classes right the, from the classes from the tests. So I'm looking at it and I'm going, no, nah, that's not good enough. So for some bizarre reason, I, I, I said, no, nah, look, I'll coach. I'll be the coach. And this is at 12 years old, Jeez, mind you. So, man. and I got friends who. This to my friends today, and the, the most bizarre thing for me is I, it felt natural to me that I somehow I'd put on a training session, I tell them what position to play, I do all that. They actually listen to me, and you go, who listens to a twelve year old, particularly <laughs> other twelve year old? And it wasn't like I was, you know, the, the king of the the, the the schoolyard or anything. I was, you know, I was just trying to fit in. But when it came to football, it just it's, it was a natural fit for me, and we ended up winning the the state championship. So I got a super naught album as <laughs> as my best on ground. Oh, you remember Nord. Super Nord. I, I remember Super Nord. Yeah. Super, Super Nord. They're a band from, they're a band from Western Australia. Yeah. Uh, they had a, a, a hit called I Like It Both Ways. <laughs> Let's hit I Like It Both Ways. <laughs> Which is, I go, who gives a kid a Super Nord album for best on ground? But I've got this That's photo. Get, get, with, with a song called I Like It Both Ways. <laughs> Try to explain that to my father. Yes. Dad, it's about Aussie rules and soccer. Yeah. You know, I like that, it. Yeah. That was the time. Da- um, Andrew, brought the, Andrew brought that home, but his dad uh, deliberately dropped his lighter that time. I don't want to see that. that. Yeah. Dropped his lighter yeah. on it. But, uh, uh, but that, do you think that that's... 
that was probably the start in your own head of, you know what, I can do this yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, well, and how long did you coach for, though? Did you coach the team just for one year or did you coach throughout uh, your high pretty school? Pretty much throughout high school. As we got a bit older, they, the school took it a bit more serious and they tried to put a coach in there, but I was still sort of running running okay. the show. And I, it just it was a natural fit. I, I, I've often said, like, my playing career was a real struggle for me because I just... You know, even though I played for South Melbourne, I played for Australia four times. I, I just knew I, I wasn't that good. I, I, I just, and I knew I couldn't realise my dreams, uh, just playing the game. I knew my limitations. For well, some certainly reason. your father reminded you yeah. of them all the time. <laughs> if I needed a reality check, every time I got home, I got one. Um, but coaching, it was just almost like my playing career was just uh, waiting for me to start my, my my coaching career, and and it was always what I felt most comfortable in. I thought, well, that's that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Well, speaking of your playing career, Ange, was it, were you always going to be a defender? Oh, no, mate. I, I, during um, my playing uh, junior days, I was always a midfielder. I love playing midfield. I love scoring goals. And then um, uh, with with South Melbourne at the time, I mean, they, they were literally, um, yeah, they were the, the biggest club in the country and full of imports, from particularly from the UK. South used to get the the best ones, but the sales pitch to most of the, most of the guys who came out from the UK in those early days ended up with Sunshine, George Cross, mm-hmm. and people used to go, "Why the hell?" Because but they used to go to to the UK and say, "Look, uh, we've got a club for you in Australia," and they go, "Where is it?" They go, "In Sunshine." Sunshine, and they used oh, to think, wow. "Oh, beaches, palm trees." <laughs> yeah, so, it's, it's near a place called Deer Park. <laughs> So, so you get all these so think- Scots and Englishmen, and they're out in sunshine, and they go, "Where's the palm trees? Where's the..." Anyway, so and and because it was it was we used to sort of South Melbourne used to buy all the best players, and it was literally ten internationals. Uh, bizarrely, one day um, our left back got injured, and um, I was in the youth team, and the, and the head coach Lee McKendry said, "Look, we're going to throw you in at, at left back." And the first time I ever played as a defender was. Um, South Melbourne first team and I played and I uh, did okay but the team was pretty strong at the time the guy who was injured was out for a few weeks and, and then I, I never left that position so the only time I actually played as a defender and if you ask anyone who played with me they especially guys like Trimmers they'll probably say I never played as a defender <laughs> I was never back there when I should have been but um, yeah I was a frustrated forward and mate. tell me Ange at the time there were some legendary coaches that South Melbourne had yeah. uh, 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 they usually do pretty well and then get sacked uh, three, oh, yeah, three weeks into the, yeah, yeah. the new season but a, as a player you know, you said you had that predisposition towards wanting to coach. Were, did, were you fascinated by the way oh, in yeah. which they coached? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and I, I always used to kind of spend a lot of time with the coaches. And, and you said, as you said, that there was a kind of uh, a turnover coach. Sometimes they got rid, rid of coaches without the coaches knowing. We had John Margaritas was coaching us at one time and we were struggling. And you kind of knew after two or three games, he's gone. Um and so all the press sec- speculation was happening. But this time, for some reason, the message didn't get to John. John's <laughs> taking training. And as he's taking training around Middle Park, he used to drive around. Uh, um, there was a kind of little uh, sideway where you can get into the ground. We saw all these people clamouring around this car. And we're watching. We're going, oh, they're protesting or something. Or they want John out. Or And we look at it, and it's Tommy Doherty. And he's waving to everyone. They've appointed Tommy Doherty as coach while John's taking he's training. He's still taking training. <laughs> Oh, no. God, oh, my God. So that was the existence of coaches. Uh, yeah, I, I had you know, Tommy Doherty, I had Rally Rasic for a little while. Yeah. And, um, what about uh, Pushkas? French, yeah, French Pushkas was just... That like, would have just been incredible for a young player to say, oh, just, to go, hang on, this is genuinely one of the legends of international football. Absolutely, mate. And, and such a humble guy, mate. He was just incredible. Like, you had to pinch yourself. So it's like, you know, it, it would be like Lionel Messi coming and coaching here in 30, 40 years' time, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. that's, that's who Pushkas was. And uh, he was such a gentle soul. It was like being coached by your grandfather. He, mm. Like if it started raining, he used to tell the coach, no, take him in, it's going to rain. <laughs> it's and, raining. Yeah, yeah, seriously. And, but we would do anything yeah, yeah, for him yeah. because he, he did love us. And we used to pester him about stuff, you know, when he played in the World Cup final. And, we'd be, and I remember once we were sitting on a plane and it's me, Steve Blair's next to me, and, uh, and, and Pushkas was always on the window seat. And I'm looking at a World Soccer magazine. And it's and it's got a picture of uh, Real Madrid, uh, the team that that um, that scored what was it seven seven three was, against yeah, uh, in, yeah. at Hampton, and he scored a hat trick. And it's got the photo there. And, and Stevie Blair goes to to the boss, goes 
boss, we used to call him boss, he goes, um, have a look at these places, tell me who all these guys are. And he always used to want to sleep. He was an old man. He just didn't want to be pissed. And he, <laughs> he asked, like, and he just looks over and he goes, we know all these guys, but who's this one? Who's this one? Who's this guy? And he goes, uh, English guy, Stan, Stan, Ding, Stan, Ding, something like this. And we're going, what? There was no English guy in the Real Madrid team. And then me and Blair are looking, it's got, you know, it's got sitting and standing. He just read this. <laughs> he just <laughs> reading this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stan Ding. Stan Ding. Straight for China, didn't he? Hey, 86 caps for China, Stan Ding. It was unbelievable. It, but he was, he, he was a great man. Uh, he was just, oh, uh, yeah, love love getting coached by him. He didn't, just didn't care about anything. You know? He'd done so it all. How long did he, how long did he last? So, so he, he stayed with us, I think, three years, and, and we won the championship. Um, but, you know, he, he, he just to say, before you go out and play, just have fun and score goals. And like the guy who played in World Cup, he wasn't worried about the pressure of, you know, yeah. if, if the supporters gave it to him, he'd turn around and give it back to him. He just did not care about anything. We had the, 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 the grand final we won against the Melbourne Knights and it was a penalty shootout. And there's a picture of him, everyone's off the bench and waiting for those crucial penalties. And he's just sitting there and he's got that, you know, the pumpkin seeds. Yeah. And he's just <laughs> munching away some pumpkin seeds on the bench. Just very relaxed, but great man. Like, if it didn't teach you anything else, it's just that the great ones are still very humble and, and, and very respectful about things. And, uh, yeah, it was an honour to be coached for him. My, I've got a more general question about managing in general, Ange, in terms of from a mildly outsider's perspective. I just, you know, I love the game, but I wouldn't, didn't play it. I didn't know. Mm. So, you know, it seems that man, uh, when you're a manager, you don't have much time. I just, yeah, and you think of, like, and has that has that changed in terms of in the old days? You'd say you know you'd lose two or three games, mate. You knew the manager was in trouble. Mm, yeah, yeah. The, the idea of stability. No. Yeah, yeah. The, is that not not back then? But does that change at all? It, it, it is more. Uh, it's certainly a lot more. Um, you know, cutthroat. I think life in general. We're just we're looking for the sugar hits all the time. We we just don't we don't like the struggle anymore. We just want things to happen immediately, and that includes football and then you gotta I, I kind of I've had the attitude from day one that you just don't worry about that stuff I never have and and um, you can't understand this is my 20th year of coaching and even when I talk to coaches young coaches they say well you know um, you know what's the biggest thing I said you need to understand and, and embrace the fact that uncertainty is a constant that if you're looking for sanity you'll never get it you just look at what's happening to Pep Guardiola at the moment right the guy's a genius right he's so far ahead of everyone else, light years. And yet because he's now had a bit of a blip with Manchester City, they're onto him straight away, questioning mm. everything. And you're going, mm. how does that work mm. after everything mm. he's done? But I know that in my 20th year, so, you know, we didn't beat Thailand, so I'm getting the same sort of uh, scrutiny that I got in my first year. And unless you embrace that and understand that in the first year, if you're looking for some space where that doesn't exist, it, it's not going to happen. So young coaches go, well, you know, if I had a five-year contract... Mate, they don't exist. Five-year contracts, 10-year contract. Work on a rolling one-year contract and just do what you think's right. And if you do that, over time, you'll you'll see whether you're successful or not. And um, it has changed. And there's certainly, a, you know, it's a lot more volatile than it ever has been. But um, from, a, from a coaching perspective, managing perspective, you, you've almost got to accept that and embrace it in some respects. Um, I like it because not I like it, but it kind of being on the edge is what I, I like about my job is that at any given time I could fall either way and at every any given time I'm always getting judged. I like that aspect of it. I, I find it quite incredible really because I, I totally understand where you're coming from. You can only challenge yourself in, in those situations. But w when I look at coaches, Pep, you, any, anybody, my you know, junior coaches, they feel like they're juggling objects of different sizes. It's mm -hmm. like you, you're juggling a tennis ball with a chainsaw and a bowling yeah, you, yeah. It's Everything's different. So there are, as you say, Guardiola's a genius, but who's to know with all the random stuff that's going on, what is the main thing? So in that situation, how do you stay clear-headed? I mean, you've you've got another. You've got all the rest of your qualifiers to go. How do you know what to concentrate on and mm. what the what the most important things I, I are? Th I think there's a core belief within you that you, you just constantly fall back on. And I think if you stay in the game long enough, you kind of you can clearly identify that. So there's there's always stuff that changes. The game evolves. Um, you know, changes, formations, tactics, players, all those kind of things. But there's a core belief that I think you take along with you. And that's what you fall back on. That's certainly what I fall back on. So, you know, whenever I'm in a situation where, and, and, and it, it, 
it's funny for me, the last three years have almost been um, a repeat of, of everything that's happened is that, you know, the first year in charge was on the eve of the Asian Cup. We hadn't won a game. People sort of questioned me about certain things. And then last year, this time, we'd lost against Jordan away. There was questioning about certain things. And Thailand, now we didn't beat Thailand. You know, we're not in the, we're third in our qualifying group. Same sort of things. But in those times, I, I, I kind of get emboldened because I, I kind of know the plan. Mm-hmm. And I've been down this road before. Um, I know what it, I kind of enjoy the struggle while other people don't like it. Um, I enjoy this bit and I kind of know what's on the other side and, and you've got to stick to it. Uh, um, so far, it's it's served me well. I mean, I, if I ever get to a point where I, you know, I follow this path that, I've, that I started 20 years ago and I fall off a cliff and it doesn't work, I'll reassess everything I'm doing. But so far, it's 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 worked well. And, and I think for, for the top managers, that's what they do. I think there's a core belief within them that, they'll fall back into and understand, well, this is why I do what I do. Maybe not everyone understands it. Probably most people won't, but I kind of know what we're doing. So is this we're, what you, sorry, Santo. Yeah. Is this what you, you know, at the, your, uh, when you're coaching the under 20s Australia at mm. the, in 2007, when, mm. when you finished there, yeah. do you think that what you were just talking about there, did you, did you lose that conviction towards the end of your tenure there? And that's like, cause I was reading somewhere where you have massive regrets about how yeah, yeah, of your absolutely. time there because yeah. you didn't stick to yeah. what you yeah, knew. That's probably the, the only, actually the only time my coaching career where I kind of didn't do that. I, I, I compromised what my core beliefs were because I, I, I fell into the trap of thinking that if you, you know, kind of do what everyone wants you to do that, you know, you kind of got people on your side and what you find out is that you don't. At the end of the day, as I keep telling all the coaches that I speak to when, when the S hits a fan and and questions need to be answered, it's you in the microphone. It's no one else. It isn't the CEO. It's not the, the chairman. It's not the captain. It's it's you. So at that point, you want to be able to talk with conviction and, and about what you've done because you believe in it. You don't want to be telling somebody else's story. And, and with the 20s, that's what happened. I mean, it was our first time into Asia. I compromised certain things. And that, that, was, that was through my own fault, and I paid a price for it. But it, it certainly... It, it, it strengthened my resolve to go back to you know what I'd started in South Melbourne, the beliefs I had, and and from then on I was kind of so from the moment I got the Brisbane job, if any, if anything, I became even more resolute about you know I don't care what other people say. In fact, probably if most people uh, don't understand what I'm doing, I'm probably on the right path. It's interesting that you you talk about getting to Brisbane because to me, oh, look, I had to be a person who just prompts stories, but I love your book so much that there was something pretty special that happened at a Brisbane. Melbourne victory yeah. game early on in your coaching career that to me uh, speaks volumes about what you're talking about in the faith. Um, yeah, involving the, the, obviously the with Brisbane, it was just about, you know, playing a different way and, you know, what people sort of call high risk play out possession from the back. It was a real, it was a real um, foundation for us early on. So, you know, we uh, we got we did pre-season, everything went well. We had the first couple of games, two, three games, we, we'd won one and drawn a couple. Then we came down here to play victory and whenever you play victory, it's a big game. But for me, it was even bigger because coming back to my hometown, family here, first time they'd seen me coach in quite a while um, with this new Brisbane team. So, you know, I felt, um, not the pressure, but I, the expectation, I wanted to do well and, and show people this team that I'd built. And, uh, you know, we started the game and, and Luke Devere, um, he was a young, you know, centre back at the time. He, he got the ball, tried to play out from the back, got cut out, um, uh, victory score. Um same thing happens again. Uh, Luke Devere gets the ball again. Instead of just booting it out of the park, he's trying to play. We cop a second. And uh, we end up losing, I think, 3-0, 3-1. I can't remember. And I remember at the time it was a real seminal moment because I'm thinking, he's doing exactly what I want him to do. Mm-hmm. How can I – and as as gutted as I was losing, and, and I'm not a very good loser, I, I, especially in that kind of scenario, I had to come in after and, and I was so proud of him that I thought, I've got these guys now. If they're prepared to do that, if a young guy, after coughing one up to cost us a goal, will do exactly the same thing in front of 25,000 people the next time around, I've got them now. And I w- walked in and I said, mate, I-, I couldn't praise you higher. And that sort of courage is what will give us success. And it was the last time we lost for 36 games. 36 games, Sam. I'm glad you teed up that story, mate. <laughs> That's... I might read this book. That's unbelievable. Well, if, you read if your dad's book. not... You sound like my dad. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no. <laughs> I might read it. <laughs> Hey, uh, have, you, have you done an audio book? <laughs> <laughs> you should, mate. You should just go. I'll read your audio book for you. <laughs> hey, guys, we're, we're kind of starting to run out of time. Ange, do you mind if we continue this conversation next week? Do you mind? Uh, happy to. Mate. Great. Can I get a lift with you on the way in next week? <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, Santo from Santo Semenid's Total Football Podcast. We hope you're enjoying our summer series. And now part two of our interview with Ange Postacoglu. What was it like coming back to the A-League? I mean, you know, there, there's interesting characters, you know, your Clive Palmers, those kind of guys. Did you have a close uh, sort of relationship with, with the owners of teams? Because what was Clive Palmer, was was it, was he about to take over uh, yeah. Brisbane? Yeah. So we, we that was, uh, I think it was my second year, might have been my second year at Brisbane. So we'd won it and we'd done really well. And then we played um, Gold Coast United and we thumped them for one or something and, and the next day I've got a call from one of the owners uh, part owners of, of Brisbane Raw Claude Baradell, um, who mm-hmm. um, he said to me Ange um, we've got to go um, I've had a call from Clive Palmer and he said he wants to meet us and I go well, what's Clive Palmer so we, we beat him last night what does he want me to do you know he goes, he goes no we have to go to his house uh, there's an important meeting so I go alright so I'm driving in this car with an Italian to an unknown destination. I'm going, if I don't get back here, I'll, I'm, set, I'm set to Georgia. Was I go to my wife, I go, if you don't hear from me in an hour, yeah. just tell them I've gone with Claude, all right? Understand, I don't know where I'm going, because I'm going, I'm not going to no. like Palmer's house. Why would I be going? No, exactly. Did anyone say, uh, don't forget the cannoli <laughs> in the lead up to this? Because then, then you know you're in trouble. You're in trouble, yeah. uh, so, so I'm in this car, and we get there, and, and Clive invites us into his house, and he was, he was very pleasant, very polite. And he started talking about he wanted to buy Brisbane Raw, and I've said, why would you want to buy Brisbane Raw? Because at the time he goes, oh, look, you know, Gold Coast isn't working and you know, I really want to own a team. So I've made a deal with FFA, but I'll only do the deal if you're the coach. And I said, oh, I said, okay. I said, look, that's fine. I said, I mean, you know, if you're the owner or whatever, that's all I'm happy to do. He goes, but he goes, oh, I just want to know, he goes, um, how are we going to work this, he goes, because I've got, he goes, and he pulls out this piece of paper from his pants, this crumpled piece of paper. <laughs> These are the eight players you're going to take from Gold Coast. So if you can write me down the eight players you're going to take from Brisbane, we'll make a team. I said, I said, Clive, no, nah, that's not how I work, mate. I mean, I, look, if you want to put your money in, I said, I'll make it work for you, but I kind of do that stuff on my own. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, well, I, I take care of football business, I, you know. So at that point, I kind of sense he lost interest and he did lose interest. And then he took this call, I think it was from Frank Lowy. I, I'm, I'm not 100%. And then he, I could hear him blowing up that, you know, this bloke won't let me or whatever. <laughs> and I think the deal was dead after that. And he come back and sat in his chair and we're kind of sitting there, me, Claude and him uncomfortable. And then Clive fell asleep. <laughs> So what do you do? What's the etiquette in that kind of situation? You're at his to, house. At his house. And I'm looking at Claude. Claude's looking at me. I'm going, so do you wait? Because apparently he's got some condition. It happened in oh, Parliament. Oh, okay. So it's a bit of a sleep apnea yeah, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, it happened in Parliament a few times. So. I would have stolen his wallet. <laughs> well, well, he was but, sitting on it, unfortunately. He couldn't get what, out of his What would have been worse for me is if he got up and started the conversation again. And, <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So was he asking, but did he even know? I mean... Did he know the players he was talking about? I mean, did, did, oh, did he kind of know about the game? The clincher was he wanted to get rid of Luke De Vick. <laughs> yeah, I said, no, mate, no, that's no, it. No, no. no I, I, didn't, I didn't delve that, that closely. But yeah, like, look, yeah, I had some, uh, some interesting that's moments. And let's, let, uh, let's fast forward a little bit in time. Um, the, I, I, this, this is the one that keeps going on in my head. The, the draw for the teams that we got in the 2014 World Cup, mm. you're sitting there. With you know Frank Lowy, I'm guessing, or, or David, Gallup. David Gallup and stuff, and they're pulling names out of the the bucket, or whatever it is, and we've got Spain, we've got Holland, and we've got Chile. Now, you're pretty good at a poker face. What, what, no, I mean, no. it's statute of limitations. You're allowed to tell us Man, how you I, felt at the time. I, and 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 to be honest, I was cancelling David Gallup when we walked in, you know, because I'm going. David, rugby league background. Although he, you know he loves his football, but I've gone. Listen, don't make any facial expression. This is important. It's an important moment for us. Whole Australia's watching, whole world's watching, our players are watching. So we can't say, oh, it's a bad draw, it's a good draw. You can't start crying. No. no. <laughs> Mate, when they pulled it out, pulled those three out, and I can see David's going, hey, they seem all right. <laughs> Chile, Spain, whole some good countries there. I've heard you know? of them. Yeah, 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 I've heard of it. That could be all right. And I'm going, you are just kidding me, aren't you? And, and I'm going, how, how the hell am I going to now... Because from that auditorium, we've got to go into another auditorium with the world's press are there, and, and including the Australian press. And I've got to make some, you know, proclaiming about how great the draw is, how bad oh, the so draw is. So you're thinking about that. You're thinking, what do I say? Mate, I, I, I had no idea. My head's just spinning. I'm going, I, I, and I, you can't go in there and say it's a great draw. People mm. go, what are you, an idiot? And I can't walk in. <laughs> I didn't want to walk in there and say this is the worst possible. We are in the group of death. Mm-hmm. I go, I, I can't do that because <clears throat> that's not part of who I am. So as I'm walking across, 
my 16 year old son who's just negative about everything you know he just dad don't embarrass me everyone knows who you are who i am and all these kind of things and i'm going i'm getting some text messages as i'm walking from one to the the other and i go i never really check my phone but i will check my phone on this one so i've checked it and james my son here's his first message i go yeah well i'm going to open the message because he'll make me laugh if nothing else he'll break the (laughs) tension so i've opened the message and he goes well dad now you've got a chance to become a legend and I thought, oh my God! What a As great message! As a sixteen-year-old, right? that is, yeah. And and I just thought that's brilliant because you know? it kind of gave me a real clarity. Well, what a great opportunity! Yeah, you know? we're up against the best of the world. We're taking a young God. team, chance to make a name for ourselves. P.S. Da- granddad reckoned you yep. stuff. <laughs> Yeah. That's an amazing thing to say. I tell you what, if my father could text, could you imagine the text <laughs> I, I would have got? <laughs> oh my god! I mean, I'm, to, to tell you the truth, guys, I'm going to make a confession. I'm going through my own grief with my 16 year old at the moment. We just went to uh, Campbelltown in uh, Western Sydney on the weekend. He wants to become a uh, a ref. <laughs> Oh, no. Wants to become a ref. Man, we should have a minute silence, mate. I'm telling you, that's <laughs> a referee. I don't know well, what, what, what we're going to is... do next. Go to the supermarket and start buying, you know, the the the, the spray, <laughs> the, the the foam, yeah. the foam. <laughs> How? What? But what has happened? How has this happened? I, I think he, he. It's a bit of pocket money. I think he's going, man, oh. hang on. But I'm, I know he's just really shaking know, his head. I know, really no, no, no. He's played at South Melbourne. He's played at Port Melbourne. He, I think he knows what he's in for. He just thinks he's going to be so damn good as a, as a ref. <laughs> I say, mate, mate, strap yourself in because you are about to have the worst mate, three years of your life. If he's doing it for pocket money, mate, I might have to just have a word and tell him, mate, his dad's worth a fortune. <laughs> just, mate, just, just, just relax, mate. It's all going to be fine. You're going to come into a lot of money. <laughs> Don't worry about this refing thing. That's going to kill. That's going to scar you scar in your you. teenage years. You know, and also embarrass his parents. I mean, really. If you, you spent thing. the last three years diving and oh. doing all that kind of stuff, but now you're going to be on the other side. Hey, um, wouldn't it be great to do work experience as a ref, as as, as a kid ref? What are they going to teach you though, mate? At tri- like, is it, was it what a three year course? Did you say? No, 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 no. no. It's, a, it's, it's, what it's, are they... The course, I reckon, the course is about two hours long. I don't think they teach you all that much. They just they just how, how to fend off fruit. <laughs> But uh, I thought a good, a good, uh, like a good class to have would be you standing there and yeah. having like Kevin Musket just yelling at you for forty five minutes. <laughs> See, handle that. that. That'd be you're a bit more, um, you're a bit more reserved on this on the sideline, aren't you? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I kind of, um, I, I mean, I get into it a bit, but I, I've always sort of, uh, I, I've, I've likened it to saying, you know, when I go to the movies. Right, I don't want people talking around me. Man. I want to concentrate on what's going on. Yeah. And and if I think if I'm talking or even my bench, I, I tell them off if they start yapping at me. I go, mate, just leave me. I want to concentrate. And I, I guess it's my way of concentrating. But it, it comes down to, to just your personality. I mean, because I, I mean, Kev was my assistant coach for that year, and I could tell he was itching to to <laughs> yeah. just have. But he knew because that, that's not how I work. That mm. he he kind of contained himself. But that's just his natural sort of personality coming out. It's how you know we all have to deal with kind of the stress of the moment and and him i think for for someone like him that's that's just his how he is naturally but that's interesting because when we spoke to him not that long ago and we we mentioned the the fact that you know that's what he's like on the bench he 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 immediately went for yeah i I realize i've got to get better in certain things so he went straight to that thinking i just wonder whether you know there are certain further steps that he can take in his own career so he's obviously an ambitious guy Do, do you think that it is important at a higher level to actually maintain that that serenity that that focus look i think what it comes down to is that you as you get older you, you do you mature a little bit more but you still got to be yourself the, mm. the one thing that 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 um punches through more than anything is if if you're just trying to be someone else or be something else it, it won't last long and and look kev's only been coaching for four or five years he'll be, he'll be coached for the next 30 and i reckon when he gets to the you know his 30th year of coaching he'll still be going off in a, in a more measured way, I'd, mm. say, uh, I'd sense. But it's still him. I, I think you've got to be genuine. If, if you're going to be a coach for a long time, a manager, you need to be genuine. If you start just doing it because you see other people doing it or you think it's going to have a effect, um, it, it doesn't work. It, it's all short-term stuff. At the end of the day, you just got to be yourself. And uh, yeah, I think Kev's a bit hard on himself uh, at times. But like I said, that's his journey as as a coach. He's, he's, he's four or five years into it and he's had a great start to his coaching career but all the challenges he's got ahead of him the best way he's going to overcome them is just to be true to himself and be a gen- you know, genuinely as he should be one of the things we're true to ourselves is we don't go in a chronological order no. i want to quickly go <laughs> back time to travel yeah, yeah okay. hey, by the way i know i know uh, what Andrew's move is by the way when he gets a bad draw because the Confederations Cup. Yeah. Draw oh yeah, he had. you know, <laughs> you know what Ange does? Well. He did it, but he did it for for the World Cup and for the Confederations That's Cup. It. 
very exciting. <laughs> it's very, we're, very, we're very excited. We want to yes. we want to play against the <laughs> exactly. best. But that is the go to, by the way. The I'm on to you. Yeah, good hey, on you. but good on you. Um, before you became a Socceroos coach, I want to ask you this. So you became a Socceroos coach on October 23, 2013. The previous two Socceroos results were Brazil and France, six nil, six nil. What are you? What were you thinking when you saw those results? Yeah. Uh, not so much the Brazil game, but certainly because of the France game. I remember it was, um, I think, I'm pretty sure it was early morning. And that night, I think Victory had a game. And uh, I remember I was I was watching it. I was watching it in bed with, with, with my wife, Georgia. And as the goals are going in, I kind of turned to her at one stage. I go, you know what? I think he might be gone. And she goes, yeah. And I go, I wouldn't be surprised if they come knocking, you know. And we started... And both of us sort of go, well, what do we do then? I mean, well, I'm one year into a three-year deal at Victory. I was I was really happy there and we're kind of building something. And um, I said, it, it's a possibility, you know. And um, and then you kind of put it to the back of your mind. But within, I reckon, you know, uh, 48 hours. Um, I mean, we, somebody must have texted straight from the dressing room because I got a text message about three minutes after the final whistle that he's gone. Wow. He's, so somebody must have texted to somebody yeah. who I know, and anyway, in our circle. So I pretty much found out straight away he'd been sacked, and uh, and then the process started. And I kind of knew I'd be one of the names, obviously, because they were going for if they were going to go for a local. But it was always a bit of me that says, you know, I think in these clutch situations, particularly with the World Cup, they usually go for a foreigner, that, you know, and then maybe after the World Cup they'd come for me. Um, but it, it happened so quickly, and then you know, I kind of. <laughs> I accepted the role, so there I am, the last victory game. I walk out, obviously a very emotional night. We're playing Brisbane bizarrely, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we end up winning one nil. And I'm walking off, and there are all the most important people in that journey, <laughs> and I'm hugging every one of them. And in the middle is Sam, and I'm going, "Hey, what are you doing <laughs> here?" You and then I go, "I can't not hug you because I'm hugging <laughs> everyone else. It's going to look." crazy and it that was, is literally the first time i met sam pang and i, I gave him a big hug one, and he, of the, one of the most emotional moments in my career he was there he was there one yeah, of the great wow. shams of all time you, <laughs> Mate, you was, what an imposter he's standing there amongst everybody I that is that, just one of the great the moments but that's not the book <laughs> that's not in the book <laughs> yeah i don't that was that was that surreal was and mate for for you to then come on our little show and and you know to get to know over the years it's been a joy for us mate as though we were really we're really excited to, to you know when you came and we can't that. we can't stay very long but no, no. it'd be remiss of us not to ask about the future n not just for the socceroos but because you have that's one th the other thing in the in the book in fact you don't even wait for the end of the book to talk about your visions for mm -hmm. the game in this country which we still think is in a pretty precarious state mm -hmm. despite the fact that people are saying that that you know that the sleeping giant has awoken and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff we still are at a precarious state we, 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 well, we are, but I think we'll constantly be in this sort of in this space unless we just make some real bold moves forward, mate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I said in the book, you know, I spoke about expansion and it's great it's come on the agenda now and people are talking about more teams and, and you just got to, you know, in our game, every time we've, we've thought big, you know, as I said in the book, we were the first code to go national you know, before mm -hmm. the AFL, before rugby league people involved in our game so let's take this all over the country because we played all over the country and and it just wasn't sustainable because after a while people didn't want to be brave in their decision making and kind of fell back into that trap of just consolidation 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 which eventually leads to shrinking which eventually leads to nothing um, instead of just being continue to be bold and I think for Australians uh, that appeals to them more when you when you talk up the game and you, you kind of go you know the game we're going to make some bold steps we're going to take some courageous make some courageous moves more teams more opportunities for young players more opportunities for australian players um i think that resonates with the australian public and and i guess that's the, the space we're in now we've you know there's a lot of talk about the tv deal but there's not there's not just one sort of solution to all this it's just about a way of thinking that the game has taken strides when people have been bold in, in the leadership positions and that's that's what it kind of requires now to take it to to that next level 
Quick one from me though. Oh, by the way, just can you imagine? Because talk about expansion centre. The uh, South Melbourne is being mentioned. Oh, yeah. coming. They're knocking the, on the door. Imagine the return of the king. Oh. Just the the music from the Lord of the Rings as as <laughs> Ange Postecoglou was just announced as the South Melbourne manager down the track. Um, well, sack him about four weeks. Yeah, later. four weeks. Four weeks. <laughs> Four weeks. Tommy Docket is here. <laughs> so, Andrew's got a bag of pumpkin seeds. It's all over, you know, that when that happens. Most famous person you've ever met? Oh, most famous person I've ever met. Um, I'm not a great one for um, famous people. I, I, I definitely never go up to anyone. Like, no. even if I... Um, recognize him um I, I, look sir alex for me i i i was wow. I, and again it's it's a football one but for me he's kind of for anyone involved in football in, in 2000 when we um we played them at in brazil the american i was coaching south melbourne you know, a bunch of part-timers um literally the back page of the uk uh, i think it was the daily mail one of those rags because uh, Mel mentioned i had pulled out of uh, the fa cup to play in this world club championships in january and their first game was against South Melbourne. And they had a picture of Johnny Sassiatis at the Caltech Servo in Kings Way <laughs> pumping petrol. They're going, uh, Man United give up FA Cup to play petrol, petrol. pumpers, right? <laughs> and so that's how they were painted. So there was there was a real heat. So we've met Man United uh, over there. And I'd do a press conference. I had to do it with, with Sir Alex. And, mate, before we walked in the press conference, he got there early and I got there early. And he was so good with his time. Like, he knew he, he was really respectful. He knew we were, he, you know, he, he um, introduced him, himself by name and he knew my name. And it was just a, it was a fantastic, like, 10 minutes uh, where, A, I was, uh, you get starstruck, but just, again, just uh, being in his company for that, that amount of time, they really uh, sat with me well. It's classy, isn't it? And it's just knowing people's names is good. And then we play them here. I, I'm in charge of the All-Stars and we've got to play Man United. Mm -hmm. Um few years back and as you know um sir alex loves a glass of red after the game so i said I, i've got to get him a bottle but i've got to get yeah. him i've got him a grain here mate yeah, i can't go get a good one yeah you know no. down at the local well sam you're there. probably working at the bottle shop at Lifton hill at the time <laughs> yeah, probably sir no it's only two three years ago right so i've i've gone and got a bottle no, of no i was still there i've got a bottle of grains right so i've spent me i go oh, i've got it and then he he resigns he, he finishes and it's david moyes and i've still no. got this i gave the david go cheap moyes, there yeah but i gave it to him and i think oh. he gave it to the kit man and they were oh, making no. tea with it oh, or something oh, and i was no. just so gutted mate man, yeah. that's a bad yeah. so i wasn't that disappointed when he got the same few four liter few cast later. cooler bar would have been fine for moyes <laughs> and thanks so yeah, much for joining us today look just to leave us we've done this before actually with you um i, I refer to this as andam ranch i believe uh, <laughs> that's, right. that's what you did it at the book launch at the book launch we asked you to read the invite that's all the way through Santa. Now, where they went after that, where they went after that, I can't. Uh... It was in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you, you've done some random uh, reading from your book before. I'm just wondering whether, as as we leave today, whether you, you'd uh, regale with uh, with, uh, with another uh, reading from your book. It's not as random as I want it to be because there's a story that I, I I love from this particular book. It's on page 115. It's when. Uh, you went to coach in Greece for a few months <laughs> and uh, and an address you made after one of the games. So uh, Who's this reading is, it, you or Ange? Ange is going to read it, if he, if he yeah, do you yeah, mind reading it. So this good. is from page 115 yeah. from Ange Postacoglu, Changing the Game. So, uh, so this is in Greece. So I remember one of the first games I was in charge of. It was one of those typical Greek league games, very defensive. Here was I, though, trying to bring an Australian mentality of trying to win at every opportunity. The game in question was against a local village team and ended in a really, really dull nil-nil draw. For the final 20 minutes, things descended dramatically. Things descended dramatically. The game became a shambles. Guys were rolling around the ground, slowing things down, arguing with the referee, pushing and shoving. It was a mess. As the referee put us out of our misery and ended the game, I brought my guys into the dressing room. I didn't rip into them. I just tried telling them, that if we were going to be in the, sa the same as everyone else, we weren't going to make any progress. I was delivering what I thought was, even considering the scratchiness of my Greek at the time, a Chichilian speech. In full oration, a radical flight, and thinking I had them, I looked over to the back of the room and I saw this one guy, a Brazilian, standing with his back to me. He had his head down, standing right in front of the sink. I wondered what the hell was wrong. Had I really upset him? Was he troubled? You know, was he washing his face? Maybe he was crying. Then I heard this whirring sound. When I got to the Brazilian, I found he was hunched over the coffee machine, grinding beans, oblivious to everything <laughs> around him. 
<laughs> so in Greece, you pack your shin guards, your boots, yeah. and you make sure you got your grinder with you. Oh, how good is that? Oh, my God. Do you, know, do you remember the guy? Yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. He ended up playing um, second division uh, in Greece. He was a good player, good player, but just <laughs> made Love this coffee. And thank you Mate. so much for joining us this week. It's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope you can come back and t- spend some more time with us. Have a great time away. Uh, good luck for the, for the rest of the campaign. It's, yeah. uh, it's not backs to the wall, but it's, no, no, it's we're, great. we're in a good situation. Next year will be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, really looking forward to it. Ange, thanks.